how healthcare providers have adapted to serve the most vulnerable Tucsonans. We're really the front line of trying to keep our community not using the hospital when they don't need to. Restaurants struggle to keep their doors open. I think until there's help, things will not get better. And hearing from Arizona's newest senator. Well, we have to act and I feel we have to comp compromise to act. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivera. Thanks so much for joining us. On the pandemic, developments this week ranged from optimism to dire. State health officials announced that by the end of the month, they expect Arizona will receive more than 380,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, with the first shipment arriving next week. But that coincided with an alert from the Pima County Health Department that hospitals are at or nearing capacity which raises concerns that hospitals will be forced to ration care or turn some patients away. Throughout the crisis, health care providers have had to make changes to the services they offer, and that's true for El Rio Health, a key provider for Medicaid recipients in Tucson. We discuss the ongoing challenges with CEO Nancy Johnson. Nancy, can you provide a snapshot of how El Rio Health has had to adapt over the last nine months here? So, you know, last March, uh, right around the middle of March, we started seeing a lot of our patients um, canceling appointments. Uh, we started seeing our schedules open up and that was the start of this pandemic. And so we had to quickly pivot in that we were worried about some of our patients who had just been discharged from the hospital. We were worried about a lot of our patients who are very fragile or vulnerable. And uh, we had to really move our staff around. So we closed down our dental health centers uh, that you know obviously was critical. And we started deploying our employees to do other things, deliver medications to our patients, um, consolidate some of our sites at the time, obviously get all of our protective equipment in place, get our health centers safe for everyone, and do a lot of really organized outreach to people that we were worried about um, in terms of them not having the care they needed, but also that they may be some of the first who were most susceptible to contacting COVID. You've since reopened the majority of your facilities and you're back to welcoming patients in person, but do you fear that some people were not necessarily pushed away, but perhaps they thought, well, then I'll just follow up later when this is all over? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've been really orchestrating over the past few months, a care camp wait campaign so that people know how important it is to manage their diabetes, to be sure they're getting their blood work done, to stay current with their medications, in October, we just did a huge outreach around catching individuals up on their mammography screening. So we don't want delays in diagnosis of serious conditions or people falling off of their regular health you know, checkups, their well visits for their children, things like that. This week, uh, the county health department announced that many hospitals were at or near capacity. What does that do to a clinic like yours where vulnerable people will, will then you know, decide, what do I do next? Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're really the front line of trying to keep our community not using the hospital when they don't need to. So a lot of the outreach to our vulnerable populations, our chronically ill patients, the patients who have just gotten out of the hospital, is how we try to keep people from using the hospital unnecessarily. We also have expanded hours here. We have a 24-7 RN triage team so that we can counsel patients, help them, hopefully get some of their needed care at home for them and keep them away from the hospitals at this critical time. Hospital resources need to be taking care of those folks who need the ICU beds. There's a lot of excitement growing over the possibility of a vaccine being here in the state within the next few days. I imagine your frontline workers will be among the first. How will you be managing those discussions? So um, all of our health center locations are set with the Department of Health Services to be able to administer vaccines. Our employees are used to being vaccinated every year for the most part with the seasonal flu vaccine. And so most of them are ready to go. Uh, we don't know the vaccine type that we'll be getting, but we've secured the freezers, uh, you know, thinking about dry ice and transporting vaccine making sure our employees, and then second, you know, looking at once again, our most vulnerable patients. Do you also get the sense that patients are looking at their health differently now? Oh, yes. I mean, it's kind of a wake up call for some people around immunizations. You know, it's been interesting to see people 
suddenly um, thinking a flu shot's a good idea this year when they historically haven't been getting a flu shot. I think people are starting to think about how do I keep myself healthier by adhering to healthy behaviors, getting enough rest, making sure I try to follow my healthcare provider's recommendations. So I think when we see something like this, we realize that taking good care of ourselves on a long-term basis helps protect us when something happens that is totally unplanned. Okay, Nancy Johnson, uh, the CEO of El Rio Health. Thank you for your insight. Thank you. Economic hardships brought on by the pandemic have weighed heavily on restaurants. New executive orders from Governor Ducey attempt to address this by easing regulations on outdoor dining and setting aside more than a million dollars to support restaurants. Whether it's enough is unclear. As Tony Paniago reports, thousands of restaurants across Arizona have already closed their doors for good. While some of those still open are calling for more aid. Joe Schneider has been working in the Tucson food scene for nearly four decades, but this year has been the most erratic one so far from boom to gloom in just a few weeks due to the coronavirus. I've been in the business 37 years and certainly um, I've seen a lot and we've been through a lot of different financial situations. Heading into 2020 was the best season I had ever experienced up until the day we closed, which was March 17th. Schneider owns what was formerly known as La Cocina. Located in a historic property downtown, it has a picturesque courtyard for outdoor seating. A lot of history here. This restaurant, La Cocina, was established in 93, and I bought it uh, approximately 10 years ago. So we've been running essentially 11 months a year uh, outside. After closing in March due to the pandemic, she reopened again last month, now joined by her two sons who are also in the restaurant business. Eli Schneider ended his operations at Bentley's House of Coffee and Tea on Speedway Boulevard. Ben Schneider shut down Tall Boys on 4th Avenue and moved it to his mother's property. The family's new cooperative enterprise also led to a name change. La Cocina became LACO, short for Love and Community Tucson. Still, it had to close again on December 6th. When we first opened up, and certainly this, this community is amazing and was very supportive, and we were actually busy for um, the first couple of weeks we were open until what we knew what happened, and that was COVID started to spike. And when COVID started to spike, people were afraid. And so they stopped showing up. And it just became to the point where a, it was the most responsible thing to do and certainly the most economical thing to do. The nearby Charro Mexican restaurant remains open, but it is also feeling a major financial impact. Ray Flores is the president of Flores Concepts, a management company which oversees various restaurants that include El Charro in Tucson. Downtown's definitely been hit the hardest from a sales perspective. Um, the government offices, the tourism industry, the entertainment efforts all are shut down right now. So the downtown stores of Charro Steak and Del Rey, which is our steak and seafood restaurants, and then El Charro downtown have been hurt the most. However, the company is moving forward with plans to open Barrio Charro in Midtown Tucson this month or in January. It's a joint venture between El Charro and Barrio bread owner Don Guerra. From the beginning we, of the year, we'd been looking around and we found this probably in oh late February, I think was when we consummated the deal. So this is sort of a pre-COVID venture that got caught up in the COVID mess. And what a mess it's been, he says. Restaurants in Arizona have laid off thousands of employees and stretched their budgets to step up sanitation protocols. On top of that, many are also dealing with landlords, suppliers, banks, and government bureaucracy. I think it comes down to we need real structured relief. Um, the, the loans are one thing, but incurring debt is a difficult concept for people to, to accept right now, because when do you get out of the debt? According to the Arizona Restaurant Association, out of about 10,000 restaurants statewide, 2,000 have closed, or one in five. The association opposes additional government shutdowns, and it supports more state or federal relief to cover payroll, rent, and other expenses. Similar to the association, Tucson's Downtown Business Partnership wants to see the federal government do more to offer business relief. Joe Schneider says it can't come soon enough. She's helping the tenants at her property by reducing their rent. She and her sons are contributing to a meals project for needy residents, and they also started a loan program for her staff. 
Their goal is to reopen sometime in 2021. People have certainly reached out and helped us. There have been there has been local help and that's been amazing. But the federal government helped us for the first few months and then they sort of let go of this like this whole thing was going to disappear. Well, it hasn't disappeared and we're left on our own to figure out how to handle this. And the fact that there isn't a stimulus package at this very moment for the millions of people that are suffering is is painful. So I look forward to the vaccine combination of mask and preventative measures and smart government policy to get us through this so that we can see sometime, hopefully, in the second quarter of 21 or so, a return to something else than where we're at right now. And hopefully, he says, that will pave the way for a major celebration, a tribute to the now famous restaurant that started serving Tucson in 1922. That we can see that legacy hit 100, it's a huge issue for us. So the light at the end of the tunnel for the Chadro family is 100 years. From restaurants to real estate, where in Arizona it's a seller's market. That's due in part to the pandemic leading more Americans to make the switch to telework, allowing some to make a move to the Grand Canyon State. We discuss that ongoing demand and current trends with Eric Gibbs of the Arizona Association of Realtors. Eric, last week I spoke with an economist who said that despite the pandemic, the realty uh, picture here in Arizona is healthy and strong. What do you attribute that to? Uh, part of a number of things. One, uh, low interest rates, um, and the fact that uh, buyers are are you know relocating to Tucson um, and taking advantage of the uh, the market that we have right now. Even though we have um, low inventory, you know, historically low inventory, um, buyers are still out there you know, are still out there purchasing um, homes. Who are these buyers? Are they coming from out of state or are they just relocating within Arizona? You, you, you've got both. You've got people relocating um, in, you know, people locating, relocating in the state. Uh, what, what, what we're seeing on that end are people are working from home and then realizing that they're going to continue to work from home. So they're now relocating close to family. Um, we, we've seen a number of those, tra those transactions going on. And then you have buyers coming in from California, Washington, Oregon are moving here to the state because of uh, the fact that their money um, can buy them more of a home than what they could buy where they're, they're currently at. Some longtime Arizonans, though, will worry that they're being priced out of the market. Is that a real concern? It is a concern, uh, but what I'm seeing right now when we talk about, say, in new construction, that they are they are trying to build uh, affordable housing. When I say affordable, so in the sense that it, it still allows the, the consumer that's here in Arizona to be able to purchase as well, um, and, and, and trying to uh, you know alleviate that uh, California money pushing them out of the out of the opportunity to be able to buy. We, we saw that back in 2007, you know, six and seven, right, where, where people came and, we, and people local Arizonans Arizonans could not purchase a home. So um, I'm seeing it, it, the, the new builders are working, are really working hard to, to make that happen. The trends that you're describing are exactly that. It sounds like we're going back to that famous housing bubble back in 2008. Is that what you foresee happening? No, this is a little different. And, I, and I've heard this conversation before, and I think it's a little different. You know, with the pandemic, um, with the pandemic and the ability for realtors, and escrow officers, home inspectors to be essential um, you know, workers in the state, we were able to continue um, doing business uh, and not realizing that the business was going to boom. It just, it really just took off. It just boomed. But I don't really think that we're in a bubble. I just see that we're, um, you know, it's a seller's market. Prices are up, are, are inching up because of that. But I still think that it's not um, overly dramatic in the sense that like it was in 2006 and seven. I don't, I don't see that, that same type of, uh, of sale. Are you seeing a fair mix of young professionals, families, and retirees who are part of this conversation? Yes, I do. I'm seeing a lot of young people um, taking advantage of the market, making that first purchase, um, as well as your um, boomers, you know, that, that are also downsizing um, and, and, and making those kind of purchases as well. So I see it all across the board of people that are buying. It's not just one demographic. So who's selling? 
That's a good question. Not a lot. Not not enough. <laughs> not enough for selling. But the, and again, it's all you know. You're probably seeing a lot more of your um, medium um, wage earners as well as um, your luxury is starting to really pick up as well too across the state. There was an article that, that talked about how luxury sales are up twelve percent. Um, over last year, we're talking in the you know above eight hundred thousand. So they, they're, that is, is selling as well. So you're starting to see some you know sales and different price points that are really um, bringing those buyers from California into 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 the market. As 2020 wraps up here and it's on somewhat shaky ground, what's your outlook as we head into 2021 for realty in the state of Arizona? I see going into the first and second quarter to be very strong, Um, still having low interest rates, um, still having the um, um, buyers out in the market buying. This has just been, I I can't emphasize enough that this has not been a normal selling season. Usually uh, business slows down right about October, November, has not slowed down, has continued to to go. And I see that moving right into the the first half of, uh, of 2021. All right, Eric Gibbs from the Arizona Realtor Association. Thank you for your insight. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me again. Tucson enacted its own mandatory curfew to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Calls from the mayor for the state to take similar steps went unanswered. That's according to her office. This week, we got insight into the city's authority to regulate residents from former mayor and current University of Arizona professor Tom Bolge. The city has charter authority, and that means that it has the right to institute rules and regulations and laws um, that protect the citizens of Tucson. Uh, so in many ways, um, the city's rules apply regardless of the state's rules unless they are in complete contravention to state law. In this instance, there is no state law that says you cannot mandate wearing of masks or that you cannot mandate a curfew if you're a charter city. And in that sense, I I don't believe that we are at all in violation of state law. These are hard to enforce, though. I mean, across the state, there have been a couple vocal law enforcement officials who have said we've got better things to do. So how does it really manifest in a community when law enforcement says, I'm not going to do this? Well, much of this is done through voluntary compliance. And in fact, the last time we had a mandated curfew um, and the state itself was shut down, uh, there was very little law enforcement that was occurring, uh, but people respected the change in the state mandate. Likewise, I think that that's what's going to be happening this time around in Tucson's 10 to 5 mandate. For a business, if people are inside their facility past that curfew time, does that allow them to skirt any issues so that they can continue to conduct their business? No, they need to be closed um, the second the curfew takes effect. And that means that after 10 o'clock, they need to close. They need not serve people anymore. Uh, and then people need to leave the premises. Do city officials, you were once one, do they take into consideration when they hear from law enforcement who says, this is not how I want my officers or my deputies to spend their time? Uh, We listen. Those are very important issues. Uh, We have to weigh as elect officials between uh, police um, and other enforcers having one set of responsibilities versus these added responsibilities. But it's up to the people who are elected, the citizen community, to decide priorities. All right. You served as mayor before. You've had to walk a very delicate line in the past with various issues. But how do you convince the public that they may not want to do this, but you believe it's necessary in the time of a public health emergency? It's a tough road. Uh, If people don't think this is real, it's very hard for a mayor or a governor to try to convince them that it is real. Um, Frankly, I have never had this kind of a problem uh, in the years that I was in office. Uh, This is a vicious, vicious issue for us. Um, The health consequences for the community are enormously important. And uh, it is, it's really hard to push on the part of elected officials to try to convince reluctant people not to do this. 
but they have little other choice because of the incredible consequences that we face as a result of people do not mask up. We've heard a lot about the messaging. I mean, is that what it really comes down to? It's partly messaging, but uh, there's got to be more than just messaging. Um, and that's why curfews and mandates become important. Uh, most people I know, maybe 95% of the people I know, do not want to break the law. Um, they're law-abiding citizens. And when uh, they're confronted with the idea that this is the law right now because of certain kinds of reasons, they will obey that law unless it's absolutely irrational for them to do so. What's the risk, though, for political blowback? Well, the risk is that we are a very divided community. We're a very divided state. We're a very divided country. Uh, there are going to be people very unhappy. Uh, a lot of people believe that it is their right not to wear a mask. And so elected officials probably need to take a risk under these horrendous circumstances that sooner or later somebody may put them out of office because they did the right thing. But they need to do the right thing. All right. Professor Tom Volge, a former mayor of Tucson, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. In the meantime, on Capitol Hill, lawmakers face mounting pressure to agree on a plan to get more relief to Americans hit hardest by the pandemic and to pass a budget that prevents the government from shutting down. One of Congress's newest lawmakers is Arizona Senator Mark Kelly. He's been on the job a little more than a week now. We recently asked him how he's settling into the role and about some of his early votes. All right. In Arizona right now, there are about 400,000 people who are without work due to the pandemic. A lot of people curious if a relief bill is coming. What do you say? Well, it has to come. I mean, it can't wait till January. We have, like you say, 400,000. I think it's 440,000 individuals are trying to get by on $240 a week of unemployment benefits. That's, that's not enough. They're having to make horrible choices about paying rent or buying groceries. That's an impossible decision for so many families. So it's up to the, the Senate and the House to come to a compromise to get that needed relief there. Um, also relief to cities and towns and, and small businesses. I mean, we can't afford to have 550,000, you know, percentage of them, small businesses in our state closed for good. That's not an option. I mean, you're there in the Senate right now talking about this very issue. How real is it for you and your colleagues to get to a point where you say we have to act? Well, we have to act and I feel we have to comp compromise to act. And uh, this shouldn't wait until after Christmas. I mean, it shouldn't even wait another day. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, but as we know, the Senate, uh, often it can be a slow process, but they're are ongoing negotiations and I'm talking to Democrats and Republicans uh, about why this is so important for our state and our country. You say you're talking to Democrats and Republicans. I know that you have voted on a few things now, mostly down party lines on issues that don't necessarily directly impact Arizona. But what are you using to guide some of these decisions, though? It's very early for you. Well, for me, it's uh, not about politics. It's about what's in the best interest of Arizona and Arizonans and the best interests of our country and, um, you know, science and data and facts. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make very informed decisions and understand uh, the specifics about what I'm voting on and making the decision based on what's in the best interest of our state and our country. How closely do you work with your colleague, uh, Kirsten Cinema, but also Republicans across the aisle right now? Well, I've been here a little over a week and um, building these relationships on both sides of the aisle, uh, talking to both Democrats and Republicans. I, I, I talked to Senator Sinema, um, you know, rather regularly. All right, as you know, there were 1.6 million or so Arizonans who did not vote for you. How do you win them over here in the next year or so? Well, I think the important part of this is uh, not about winning them over right now. That's not my job. My job is to represent them and their families in the best way I possibly can. And, um, you know, my, my role is uh, to make decisions that benefit them and benefit our state. Uh, the, the other thing about winning people over, I'll, I'll worry about that later. I mean, that's, that, that's an election. And uh, my job right now is to, is to put the team together and to do the absolute best job I can for 
our state and for everybody in our state. In building your team, do you have a fair mix of voices when it comes to metropolitan parts of the state as well as rural Arizona? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I have a, a, a outreach director for, for tribes. We have a northern Arizona presence and we'll have a northern Arizona uh, office. We have a southern Arizona office that also includes very rural areas of the state. Um, state office uh, that will obviously will be in, in, in Phoenix. And uh, we're, we're trying to make sure that we, we uh, have a presence in as much of the state as possible. And we're even looking at some options of a mobile presence um, so we can get to all corners of the state and reach everybody. All right, Senator, this week, of course, there's news that the vaccine could be in the state of Arizona as soon as the next two weeks or so. But the state health department here in Arizona has raised some caution that rural Arizona might be left out of the mix early on only because of the logistics of uh, getting the vaccine to every part of the state. What could you do in the Senate right now to ensure that the distribution will be fair and equitable? Well, at this point in the COVID-19 relief package that's being, that we are negotiating, uh, there is money in there for vaccines and vaccine distribution. Uh, and it's gonna be up to the state to make sure that that distribution is equitable. In metropolitan, but also rural areas, we'll have a priority list. I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking with the governor again about this. What's, what's the plan? What's the distribution plan? What are the, what are the priorities? Uh, but the role of the United States Senate is to make sure that Arizona has the resources so we're working to make sure that COVID-19 relief package has the funding to make sure that there is a distribution, there are funds for distribution in the states. Senator Kelly, thank you for your time. Great, thank you. As I mentioned earlier, it's widely expected that some Arizonans could have access to the coronavirus vaccine by the end of this month. But questions remain about the challenges that distribution could present. Next week, we'll work to answer some of those questions with a panel of experts to include Dr. Richard Carmona, the former U.S. Surgeon General, and Tara Sklar, a law professor at the University of Arizona. You can send your questions to us via email at arizona360 at azpm.org or contact us through social media. And that's all for now. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.